Good day, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. This session will begin at the top of the hour. everyone. Welcome to the webinar today. I'm your host, Mike Lasecki at the Maricopa Community Colleges in Phoenix, Arizona. Our topic today is preparing a budget and budget justification for your NSF ATE proposal. It's my pleasure to, undo, to introduce Elaine Kraft, who's our lead presenter today. Elaine is the PI, Principal Investigator, at Mentor Connect and the Executive Director of the South Carolina ATE Center of Excellence. Welcome, Elaine. We're really looking forward to today's presentation. Thank you, Mike. It's my pleasure to introduce you to my co-presenters for today's webinar, Ellen Haas, co-principal investigator, and Charlotte Forrest, co-principal investigator and project manager for MentorConnect. And I'm delighted to welcome our special guest, Dr. Celeste Carter, co-lead for the ATE program at the National Science Foundation. Dr. Carter will be on hand during the webinar to provide program officer tips and to answer your questions. This technical assistance from MentorConnect would not be possible without our funding source, the National Science Foundation Advanced Technological Education Program. As we begin, I want to clarify that MentorConnect team is not speaking on behalf of the National Science Foundation today. The opinions we express are our own. We will be sharing information extracted from NSF publications and from our own experience. Today's agenda includes budget preparation, which is an integral part of proposal preparation, line-by-line -line instructions for completing the NSF budget form, and advice on how to prepare good budget justifications. You will be given several opportunities throughout the webinar to ask questions. In addition, the slides from today's webinar will be available to you within a couple of days following the broadcast. For this reason, you may want to take notes, but it is not necessary to write down everything. We will conclude today's broadcast by asking you to complete a very brief evaluation survey. The information you provide helps us improve our MentorConnect technical assistance webinars and provides essential data needed for reporting to the National Science Foundation. You might wonder why we are providing this type of technical assistance to potential NSF ATE grantees. <clears throat> Excuse me. The answer lies in one of the primary goals for the Mentor Connect project, which is to help more of the nation's two-year technical and community colleges, colleges benefit from the NSF ATE program and funding. The ATE grants <clears throat> are implemented primarily at two-year technical and community colleges, and ATE projects focus on the preparation of technicians and advanced technologies that drive the U.S. economy. Today, we want you to learn how to correctly complete the NSF budget form, how to prepare a budget justification, why a good budget helps make a good proposal, how you can avoid common errors, and where you can find budgeting answers and other help along the way to becoming an ATE grantee. The budget form is an online form within the proposal submission function in Fastlane. The information you enter into this form becomes part of your overall NSF grant proposal. If I may deviate for a minute, there is something else you should keep in mind. <clears throat> While it is permissible to submit a grant proposal using grants.gov, we strongly encourage you to use Fastlane for submitting in a, um, grant proposals to the NSF. There are extra steps required for information to be transmitted 
from grants.gov to NSF. There is a time lag associated with this transmission, so you can't be certain when a proposal will be received by NSF. Also, grants.gov does not adhere to the NSF proposal deadlines and will accept proposals on the final day after the NSF deadline. In addition, certain forms that are required by NSF are not supported by grants.gov. These forms must be submitted separately to NSF. Proposals received by NSF without the required forms are returned without review. These are just a few of the reasons why we really encourage you to use FastLane for submitting grant proposals to the NSF. The help desk for FastLane is terrific, and MentorConnect can help too by providing information and resources to help you navigate FastLane and the proposal process. Now, let's get back to the budget. The budget section of FastLane automatically generates year-by-year -year budget forms for your use. Within the form, totals are calculated by budget category and by year. Once budget forms are completed for each year of the project, an automated system generates a cumulative budget for the proposal. The budget justification, however, is not a form. You will need to develop this document from scratch to explain the amounts entered into the budget form and how they relate to your pro project plan. The key thing to remember is that your budget should clearly and specifically align with the scope of work of the project. There should be a very clear link between the money being requested and what you were requesting the money to support. The budget and work plan should support one another. In other words, they should be codependent. You will hear me use that word throughout this webinar. Many parts of an NSF proposal are codependent. So correlation and consistency throughout is very important. As we get started, let's find out how much experience you've had. Maytek, you want to poll our audience? Well, it looks like we have a mix of experience in the audience today. Whether you are a budget veteran, or if this is your, uh, if this is all brand new to you, over the next hour we hope to broaden your understanding of budget and budget justification preparation. Okay, Maytek, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Thank you. As mentioned earlier, before the broadcast started, those registered for today's webinar received a handout tutorial on FastLane access for proposal and budget preparation. So I will move us to that point in the process. Once a proposal has been initiated, you will have access to all proposal sections, including the budget. Each section is activated by clicking on a Go button. The first step is to select funds for year one. You will notice that this is also the screen where you will upload your budget justification. Note the red arrow on the left. There are options provided when working on this page that are helpful. For example, if your budget will be very similar year to year, you have an option to have the information from one year transferred to the budget form for the next year. If you do this, however, be very careful to make all edits that are applicable to the next year's work and keep things aligned with your budget justification. Realistic budgets are rarely identical from year to year, but rather they change somewhat as the project progresses and activities and anticipated costs change. The budget form begins with personnel costs. 
The first information to enter is for Senior Personnel, Section A of the budget. This slide provides a hypothetical example. So who are Senior Personnel? For completing the budget form, these are individuals who are employed by your institution who serve as Principal Investigator, Co-Principal Investigator, or other senior leadership role for the project, and who will receive compensation from the grant. Now, it is possible to have individuals who serve in these roles who are not compensated or who are from another institution, and thus are paid from a different section of the budget. In this section, only include people who are employed by your institution who will receive compensation. Another point I've been asked to stress is that institutional grant writers should not be among those listed as senior personnel in the budget, even if the individual will contribute to the work of the grant. During the forums webinar on May 11th, we will explain how to include other supporting individuals, such as grants administrator or student recruiter, in a proposal. Now, back to completing the form. You don't actually enter names on the budget form, but rather you select from a list of those who have previously been registered for your institution. Note that you may only select individuals who have been previously registered in Fastlane. This is just one of many good reasons for not doing budget work at the last minute. If you discover that a person you need to name in the budget isn't registered, it takes time to register them in Fastlane, and only someone with Fastlane administrative permission at your institution can register a new person. The same thing is true for subawards. For an organization to receive a subaward from your grant, the organization must be registered in Fastlane. In addition, all senior personnel included in the subawardees budget, which is separate from your main project budget, must be registered in Fastlane by that organization. These are definitely not last minute tasks. I've faced a crisis or two in the, over the years with this issue, and it is no fun. My advice is that if you have multiple people you are considering concluding in your budget, register all of them. When you prepare the budget, you will select only the ones you want to include. You can also deselect a name if plans change. So don't delay in registering personnel in Fastlane because you are not yet sure exactly who will be included in your budget. One last thing to note on this slide. A calculate option appears at the end of each budget section. It is helpful to calculate as you go along so that you can keep an eye on budget section totals. Beware, however, that the calculate function does not save your information should you exit the system. I will show you where you have the option to save your work. This slide shows the very important, oops, it's not the slide that shows that. Let me see if I can find it. There we go. This slide shows the very important save command. There is only one save command key on the budget form, and it is all the way at the bottom of the page. After each section of information is entered, I recommend scrolling all the way to the bottom to section L and save. If you do this, you can come back to the budget at any time, and previously entered information will be waiting for you. Forget? and you get to start all over again. Now, I will walk you through more budget form specifics. On this slide, you can see an actual budget form. On the left, the NSF budget categories are listed. This list is important. We strongly recommend that you use these categories in the alphabetical order presented as an organizing tool to organize your budget justification. Both reviewers and program officers will appreciate a budget that is organized this way. A little later, I will show you an example of how to do this. NSF budget categories are likely to be different than for budgets you may work with at your college. It is important to understand how NSF defines each of these categories so that you can plan and submit your budget accordingly. Once funded, you will need to work with your business office to develop a clear crosswalk 
between the NSF budget categories and the budget codes that will be used by your college. Now, if Maytech can get the slides back up for us, we will take a look at each of the budget categories. As you can see, there are two uh, personnel sections. Section A is senior personnel, and Section B is other personnel. There is a separate Section C for fringe benefits that are associated with personnel costs at your institution. Once again, let's look at a sample budget allocation for Category A, Senior Personnel. Note the red arrow near the bottom of the slide. This is where you can add or delete individuals in this section. In general, individuals in senior personnel roles should be receiving some financial support to conduct the work of the project and help ensure its success. However, if you have a person serving in a senior personnel role who will not receive money from the grant, the individual should also not be included in the budget. Do not include anyone for whom the budget entry will be zero dollars. It is important that the amount you budget for an individual aligns with the institutional salaries or pay rates for that individual. An individual may not be paid more or less than their standard or normal compensation from the institution. Do not budget or plan for an individual to receive more than 100% of his or her full-time salary in a given time period, such as a semester, without first discussing this with an NSF program officer. The proposal and award policies and procedures guide, which is NSF document number 17-1, addresses grant support for personnel and any deviation therefrom needs to be pre-approved by a program officer. I mentioned previously the codependence of the budget with the proposal. The time allocation for anyone in a senior personal ro personnel role for a project shows up multiple times in the grant proposal. It is important that the information you provide be consistent with each reporting. For example, senior personnel time will appear at least four places in your proposal on current and pending support forms, in the budget, in the budget justification, and in a required list of individuals receiving compensation from the grant. It is easy to get tripped up, so be careful and consistent. When you allocate funds to support personnel, you need to be reasonable and very specific, both within the proposal and in your budget justification, about the work the individual will be doing for that compensation. It is never good if an individual appears to reviewers to be overcompensated for too little work, as specified in the project description. Likewise, reviewers worry when there is too little compensation for an extensive scope of work. Principal investigators are expected to be compensated for their time working on a project, either with direct financial support or release time. Because time and compensation calculations are an area where reviewers and program officers often find errors, I want to provide a couple of very specific examples to help you do this right. Before I walk you through this example, I would like to note a couple of things. First, if you carefully read the NSF guidelines, you will see a reference to a two-month limit on faculty time. However, for ATE projects, faculty are not necessarily limited to two summer months, as is the case with many other NSF programs. However, you should discuss any personnel support that is outside the NSF proposal and award policies and procedures guide with a program officer before submitting your proposal. Also, as a general rule, faculty time should always be reported as academic and or summer months and not calendar months, even if the faculty member has a 12-month contract. Now, in this first example, we will assume that the principal investigator is a faculty member whose nine-month or academic year contract is $54,000. This faculty member plans to spend the equivalent of one day per five-day week working on the project during fall and spring semesters, and he or she will work full-time on the grant for the equivalent of two months in the summer. 
During the academic year, this work plan calls for one-fifth or 20% of the person's time. In this example, we will assume one course release for a faculty member who typically teaches five courses per semester. However, the typical faculty teaching load may differ at your institution. Whatever your situation, you will want to calculate the percentages and work month equivalents based on your college's faculty loading practices. You then prorate the budget request accordingly. Even if a faculty member will be working on a grant all year long, don't report time as 12 months in the budget or on current and pending support forms. The time that you should include on these forms is a fraction of that person's total work time that will be supported by NSF funds. To do this calculation, you need a person's salary per month and the number of academic months that equate to this amount of release time. For summertime, you just need to know what the monthly salary rate will be for you to apply. The time calculation in this example gives us 1.8 academic months for the faculty member's time in fall and spring semesters. To this, add two months salary for the summer work. The total time is reported separately by academic months and summer months, but the budget dollar request will be the sum of the two. The picture insert on this slide shows how to report academic and summer months. The calendar box is left blank. You should never put a number in the calendar month box when reporting academic or summer months and vice versa. Here is a different example. This time we are looking at an individual who is not a faculty member and works on a 12-month contract at the college. The person's 12-month salary is $40,000 in this example. If you do not have a gross monthly amount available, simply divide the annual salary by 12 to determine the monthly amount to use. The person's time commitment to the project will be one day per five-day week year-round, or 20% of his or her time. The first step is to determine the equivalent number of calendar months. In this case, 20% yields 2.4 months. The monthly amount is multiplied by 2.4 to provide the budget request per year. In this situation, time for an employee who is not faculty, again I repeat, not faculty, should be reported as calendar months. The picture insert on this slide shows how to report this person's time. So I beg you to fight the urge to put a number in every box. You should never mix calendar months with the other categories when reporting a person's time. If you put a number in the calendar box, leave the other two blank. Keep in mind that a grant may alter the work time allocation for an individual, but not the individual's compensation. Also, the budget should be based on prorated time equivalents. Even though a person may be working on the project over the entire 12-month year, you only report the portion of that 12-month time for which grant support is being requested. Now we're going to check and see if you are awake. Hello everyone. At this time, if you would, just use the polling function to input your answers to this question. You want to request 20% of a faculty member's salary for a one course reduction for two semesters. How will you enter the NSF supported months in the budget? And we'll take just a quick few more seconds and we will discuss the results. All right. Thanks, everyone, for your input for that question. Um, at this time, I would like to throw this over to Dr. Carter to give us some advice on um, how you should calculate these months. 
Okay, well, hi, everybody. And it's a real pleasure to be on the webinar this afternoon. And it looks like just about everybody was paying attention, because this is that um, 0.2 times a nine-month academic appointment, which comes out to 1.8 academic months. So 93.2% of the people got that one right. So that was, that was what you would do, is you would put down 1.8 under academic months for the correct answer for that question. OK, yeah. so um, moving on, um, some, some of the things you, you, want to, uh, you want to make sure that, well, some of these are co very common mistakes. Um, one of the things you don't want to do is put in your percent of time instead of months. Um, you want, uh, you don't, we often see people come in and they'll say, well, I'm going to work 12 calendar months, nine academic months, and three summer months. And that is not a fatal flaw because um, the reviewers who are going to first read your proposal are looking and basing their ratings on the intellectual merit and broader impacts. But that is certainly something that should your proposal review well, the first thing a program officer will start asking you about is, uh, uh, is developing a revised budget where you actually get the correct number of, uh, of months and salary in there. Um, you want only your principal investigators and other senior personnel that are at your college. You don't want to include faculty who are not at your college. That, that brings up something else we'll discuss, which is a, a sub-award. And uh, you don't want to have someone's name there with a zero dollar amount in the budget. There's another way that you can discuss someone who will provide um, work on the project, but that you are not requesting funds for. So I think those are some of the, the uh, mistakes you, you want to avoid. So if we can have the next slide, and I'll turn it back over to Elaine. All right, we're going to move on to the next section of the budget, which is other personnel. As you can see from this photo of the actual budget form, the other personnel section includes several categories that are not likely to be applicable to NSF ATE grants, such as postdoctoral scholars. You may, however, have other person, professionals who will be compensated to help with your project. I've seen this category used for jobs such as lab assistant, webmaster, other technical support personnel, or project coordinator. Secretarial or clerical support can be included only in very limited specific circumstances. In most cases, indirect costs are designed to cover this expense. To be eligible, the work must clearly support the work of the grant and be distinct and distinguishable from functions that are normally performed by the college. You can check out the specifics in the NSF Proposal and Award Policies and Procedures Guide, that PP, PAG book. <laughs> it's got a funny little acronym. Chapter 2, Subpart C, Subsection G, that addresses budget and budget justification. Note that students are typically paid hourly rates. The time is capped at 20 hours a week during the academic year and 40 hours a week in the summer. The total amount to be paid per year that you indicate on the budget form for anyone in this category should be backed up by hourly calculations that are provided in your budget justification. Once you have entered all personnel salaries and wages, next you will need to determine fringe benefits for the requested salaries and wages. On this slide, you can see that you insert only one number for total fringe benefits on the salaries and wages that you included in sections A and B. Explain your fringe benefit request in your budget justification, stating the fringe benefit rate that was used. Fringe benefit expense should be prorated based on the percent of a person's time being supported by the grant. If the grant is supporting 10% of a person's salary, then it should also be supporting 10% of the total fringe benefit for that individual. Now, um, 
you'll see that uh, this particular slide points out that all personnel except graduate students should be included in that uh, fringe benefit calculation. So this is good to keep in mind as well. All right, let's see if we have some questions for Dr. Carter at this time. All right, thank you, Elaine. Um, and our presenters have covered quite a bit of information so far, so um, feel free to post questions using our uh, chat box feature. But the first question that we received um, is in reference to calendar year appointment. And so we'll take it from Vicki. What if your faculty are issued a calendar year appointment and are not recipients of academic year and summer month year appointments? Dr. Carter, can you help us address this question? Yes, I can. And, and, I, and I know this gets a little bit sticky. And Elaine was saying, even if you have a 12-month appointment, if you're a faculty member, you should use academic and summer. But if you really have a calendar year appointment, what you would do is describe that in the budget justification and use calendar months. So you want, you want your appointment to reflect what you're asking. Um, where it gets sticky is when people can't decide, and so they just put something in all three categories. And, and, and that's, again, that'll get you a, revised, a request for a revised budget. Awesome. Thank you. And um, one more reiteration from a question uh, that was posed and answered in the chat box. But the question was, if you are applying under a, a given solicitation with a max of $200,000, which we believe they're referencing new to ATE, are there any circumstances when more money can be requested? And what occurs if uh, that limit is exceeded? So that, that's actually a really good question. And, and this comes up uh, fairly frequently in proposals where people have not asked the question, but they come in wanting to be reviewed as a small, a small project that's new to the ATE program, but their, their final budget request exceeds 200000 At that point, program officers who are looking at the proposals and sorting them into disciplinary piles, including that small new to ATE pile, are going to put your proposal in the wrong, in the wrong category. Uh, it will still be reviewed. It will not be returned without review, but you won't be reviewed in the small new category. You, you will be reviewed as a regular project. And the only time you might get around that is if you very clearly in the first sort of sentence of your project summary or said, this uh, proposal is a small project for institutions new to the ATE program. Then hopefully we'll catch it and we'll get it into the right category. And you might say, well, what dif difference does it make as long as it's reviewed? Um, the, the proposals that come in in small new to ATE uh, are reviewed by separate panels of people who have really a lot of expertise in looking at these proposals, at, at your ideas, and thinking about, have you come up with a really good idea and you've stumbled a little bit on a few things that, that uh, really aren't flaws that can't be fixed, things that a program officer could, could, um, could negotiate and fix. And so that's one of the reasons if you want to come into that category, you want to be reviewed on those panels, not the regular panels where budgets can go up to 900000 over three years. So I, I know one other, uh, one other question that, um, that, was, that was posed uh, was, can, can, can faculty be paid a bonus for doing some of this work? And, and that comes into um, extra compensation over the, uh, the, uh, the, the regular salary of the person. ATE does allow that. It really can't be in the form of a bonus. But if you're doing things that, are, that, are, that put you into an overload that relate to the project, you absolutely can request funds for that. It's always a good idea if you drop an email to a program officer, that can be me or anyone else who's listed on the solicitation. Just explain what you want to do and why. And um, one of the things you can always do is when a program officer emails you back and says, yes, that seems perfectly well justified, you can always save that email 
and include it in, in, the, in the supplementary document uh, section of your proposal, just so that reviewers can look at that and say, oh, well, look, they're asking for overload here, and, uh, and, and it's, been, it's been approved by a program officer. Awesome. Incredibly helpful, Dr. Carter. Um, with that, we will move uh, forward in the presentation here, but please, uh, we really appreciate your questions, so keep those coming. Um, there will be more opportunities to ask questions. Now we will turn the presentation over to Ellen Haas, who will discuss some additional budget fields. Thank you, Charlotte. Uh, so I wanted to move forward and cover equipment. So NSF allows you to budget for equipment and instrumentation costs, such as laboratory or field instrumentation uh, or scientific or industrial machinery, provided that the items are necessary to support your grant activities and are not otherwise available and accessible. So keep in mind that you'll need to justify any equipment you are purchasing for the grant in terms of student use and learning outcomes. And in addition, any equipment purchased with grant funds must have a service life of over one year. So in budgeting equipment, if you look at the form, you'll see that this category is where you would list single items of equipment with an acquisition cost of $5,000 or more. So in addition to the price of the equipment, be sure to factor in the cost of any modifications, attachments, or accessories needed to make the equipment usable for its intended purposes to come up with the total acquisition cost. So as an example, if you're purchasing a piece of industrial machinery that costs $4,000, but you also need two attachments that cost $500 each to make it usable, that would bring your total acquisition cost for this piece of equipment to $5,000, so it would be budgeted in this category. As another example, if you were purchasing laboratory equipment or GPS units or some other instrumentation that individually costs less than $5,000, then that would be budgeted under materials and supplies, which we'll cover shortly. Do note that there may be budget restrictions around equipment in the new ATE program solicitation once it's available. <clears throat> but the most important thing to note about equipment is that your equipment cost should be relative to and fit within the overall scope of your budget. So including a budget that requests funds for equipment that takes up all or most of your budget would not be a good idea. So in addition to budgeting reasonably for equipment costs, you must budget in accordance with your college's organizational practice. Uh, your, your equipment must be acquired in accordance with your college's organizational practice. So do note that your college may classify equipment differently than NSF. But your college um, will need to go by NSF's definition of equipment when budgeting for the grant. So also, when constructing costs for your budget, do be sure to ask about educational discounts from equipment suppliers. Some of them may offer discounts to you, and then you can apply the actual cost of the equipment to your budget. And just as a quick take on what equipment is not, NSF funds cannot be used to support costs that would normally be made if you didn't have a grant, such as laboratory upgrades or routine teaching activities. And most importantly, all equipment costs will need to be detailed in your budget justification, which includes why you need this equipment, who will be using it, and how it will be used. Now we move into the travel category. This travel line is only to be used to budget for travel costs for project staff or college personnel that may not be project staff but are traveling to help accomplish project objectives, such as faculty members that need to attend a professional development meeting to be able to test project-generated materials in their classes, as an example. Uh, you would not budget for travel of advisory committee members, speakers, or consultants under this category, only project staff and college personnel traveling for the project. You may include only travel necessary to accomplish project objectives, for example, funds may be requested for field work, attendance at meetings and conferences, and other travel associated with the proposed scope of work. Again, attendance at meetings or conferences must be necessary to accomplish your proposal objectives or to disseminate your results. So when budgeting, most institutions have their own guidelines on mileage rates and per diem and NSF accepts these as the budgeted travel allowance should be consistent with the policies of your organization as administrators of the grant. However, you will need to note some restrictions on travel. You must book the most economical form of travel, such as economy class airfare. Uh, first class is unfortunately unallowable. Uh, and if you, if you need any foreign travel, this must be done on US carriers. 
Travel expenses must be reasonable in terms of the number of trips to be taken and the amount budgeted for each one. You'll also need to detail your travel expenses in terms of why this travel is necessary and include accurate travel estimates in the budget justification. For example, if you're budgeting to attend a conference, you'll need to include the actual hotel rates for how many dates of attendance, search airfares for your time frame of traveling and include them, and be sure to budget for meals and ground transportation costs. So you'll need to construct the best estimate um, that you can. Uh, a very important consideration is that it's unallowable to use federal funds for alcohol or for entertainment costs. And this travel line is also where you would budget as new PIs to attend the National ATE Principal Investigators Conference held each October in Washington, D.C. It's a good idea to include funds for at least two team members and up to five to attend the annual ATE PI conference. If you're applying for an ATE grant in October 2017 and you're awarded, you would be expected to attend the 2018 ATE conference. Uh, do note that ACC provides some assistance for the ATE conference by covering the cost of registration and two nights lodging cost for two people per ATE project. So you'll want to consider budgeting airfare and other travel costs to or from Washington, D.C. for two team members to attend and for full travel, lodging, and a registration fee of $300 for any additional team members. And detailed information on the ATE conference and cost entail can also be found on AACC's website. So now we move into the category of participant support. So if your college is planning to host or offer conferences, meetings, or training workshops, um, other short-term instructional or informational sharing activities as part of your grant, the cost to support the participants or trainees of those events would be budgeted under this category. Participant support costs can be used for stipends, travel, and other related costs to support attendance at workshops or conferences. So it's important to distinguish between participants and project staff. Participants are not employees. They are individuals who are recipients of a service or training provided by your college's NSF-funded event. Um, while participants perform no direct work for the project, they are a vital part of your grant activities, and they can be required to complete training and provide input to be eligible to receive stipends and travel support. So as you can see from the slide, participant support costs are budgeted in the following four categories, stipends, travel, subsistence, and other. So when budgeting, please consider that all participant support costs must be reasonable and be limited to the days of attendance at the event, plus the actual travel time required to reach the event location by the most direct economical route available. Uh, participant support costs should also conform with the policy of the college or grantee organization, such as by following your college's travel policies. You'll need to provide detailed information in the budget justification pertaining to participant support costs. So under stipends, you need to provide the stipend amount that each participant would receive and what expenses are figured into the provision of that stipend. Under travel, you need to explain the purpose of the travel and the time allotted. And again, note that this travel line is separate from Section E travel that I mentioned previously. Travel, e, uh, travel in Section E is for project personnel, and the participant support travel is for your participants or trainees. Under subsistence, you'll need to provide the amount allotted for subsistence, which can be a food per diem or for meals, and again, specify the period for which you are providing for subsistence. You'll also need to consider that if meals or lodging are furnished without charge or at a nominal cost to the participant, uh, such as having some of those meals be included in the registration fee, then the per diem or subsistence allowance needs to be correspondingly reduced. So as an example, if breakfast and lunch are included as part of your training activity, you cannot also reimburse your participants for the cost of those meals. And as I previously mentioned, and it can't be stressed enough, NSF funds cannot be used for the purpose of alcohol or for entertainment. Under other, this is where you could list other expenses associated for the participants and how it is relevant and necessary to the project, such as the printing and preparing of training materials or providing flash drives with project materials. And a few participant support budget considerations. You need to specify the number of participants to be engaged or served by the project. And you need to note some important um, considerations about the categories. Uh, money cannot be transferred in or out of this budget category without NSF approval. 
And in addition to not being able to transfer money in or out of this budget category, you also can't move money around within the specific categories of stipends, travel, subsistence, and other without obtaining program director approval. So you'll really want to be thoughtful about how you budget in the category of participant support. Um, and on that note, I'd actually like to turn it over to Celeste Carter to provide some more program director tips regarding this budget category. Okay, so um, hello again, everybody. Um, one of the big things is, is if you're requesting funds and participant support, please provide the number of participants. That's another common mistake that happens. Um, again, uh, uh, the, the although although I know the last bullet on this says it's a sacred category, what it really means is, and there was a question um, from from one of the participants today from Shamsi who said, uh, um, "Hey, we got our high school teachers." Um, in, in this participant support category, and now our college is saying that they shouldn't be paid that way. So it's, it's not a, an enormous deal, but it, what it means is, is that within um, Fastlane, um, there is an opportunity for you to, to submit to the National Science Foundation, and it'll actually come to your cognizant program officer, any kind of a notification or request. And this could be everything from you know, um, my, my HR just told me that I can't pay the people, uh, even though the money is in that category, they don't think it should be used that way. Um, you, can, you can file a request and say, for this reason, we're asking to move this amount of money that would be going to our high school teachers to another, to another section of the, uh, another, another, basically another budget line. Um, it, as long as it's reasonable, I don't think that any of us would have a problem. Uh, another thing to point out to you is if you haven't, it, it, one of the things you'll get from the National Science Foundation, although it normally goes usually to the president of your institution, is an award letter. And in that award letter, you'll have two people named for contacting at the National Science Foundation. One will be your program officer, and that could be me um, or any one of the other uh, people, program directors that work on ATE. The other is a grants officer, because although as a program officer, I can take the reviewer ratings, make my own um, uh, questions and judgment call about your proposal, and recommend it for award, I actually never make an award. There's another division within the National Science Foundation called the Division of Grants and Agreements. These are the people that actually make the award for your project. So that grants officer is going to be the person who's got a lot more expertise than I do in some of the more kind of thorny questions that come up about, about, um, about some of the budget questions. And, and I know they always do come up. So, so it's a good thing to be aware. And if, you, if a program officer doesn't forward you that award letter, that's something I try and get everybody to do so that you know the names of the people. Um, you can a ask, your, ask the head of your institution if, if you could get a copy of that award letter, because it's really important that you have both your program officer and your grants officer name. So, and I'm, and I'm, I'm not sure if there were other questions that and, directly um, related to participant support. Yes. And uh, Dr. Carter, I believe um, Ellen Haas has gone ahead and addressed a few of the questions that came into the chat box. Um, at this time, we would like to thank uh, everyone for their questions. And Dr. Carter, we sincerely thank uh, you for your, mm -hmm. for your time today. It's been incredibly helpful. Any additional comments or questions? Well, right. I'd just like to thank so, everybody um, and say I'm, 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 hopping, I'm hopping off early because I have another webinar to, to, to participate on. <laughs> we sure appreciate your time. And um, any additional questions, we'll absolutely reach out. Thank you. And Great. Thank so you very much. Time, thank you. At this time, we will now finish up our discussion about completing your budget entries. So um, with that, back to you, Ellen. Well, thank you, Charlotte. And just a note as the questions in chat, we'll try to address those on a final question break. And if we run out of time, we will address them post-webinar and send them out to all participants. So your questions will, will be addressed. 
Um, to move forward to other direct costs, other direct costs, I think, yes, here, can be included in your proposal budget, and those are categorized as materials and supplies, publication costs, consultant services, computer services, subcontracts, and other. To move forward to cover them individually under materials and supplies, these include items that are project specific and demonstrated as necessary to run the project that cost $5,000 or less. So if you remember when I talked about equipment as having a total acquisition cost of $5,000 or more, um, materials and supplies would be $5,000, would be anything under $5,000. So as an example, if you're uh, purchasing 20 handheld GPS units for surveying at a cost of $300 per unit for a total cost of $6,000. This amount would be budgeted under materials and supplies as the individual cost per unit is under $5,000. Again, please note that NSF doesn't allow for the purchase of desks or office furniture or for general office supplies that are not being used exclusively for the project. And materials and supplies need to be directly tied to the project, and items such as plasticware, chemicals, and project-specific office supplies can be budgeted under this category. Under publication, documentation, and dissemination, funds may be requested related to documenting, preparing, publishing, and sharing research findings and supporting materials that are coming out of your grant activities. Uh, this generally includes uh, things such as uh, reports, editing, documentation, storage of data and databases, web pages, and the production of posters or exhibits. Uh, for example, as new PIs, you would be expected to attend the annual AT ATE conference and participate in a showcase session, session to share the strategies and resources of your project. So funds in this category could be used to develop an exhibit, poster or other materials to disseminate information on your project outcomes. Uh, consultant services. So consultant services is where you would budget for people that are working on the project but are not part of the project staff. So this applies to those individuals that are paid a fee for service as external contractors. Note that you'll need to identify and justify your need for consultants in the budget justification as well as include anticipated cost and length of services that details how many days or hours the consultant will work and at what rate of pay. NSF requires that information be given on time and effort, so be specific and don't include a lump sum in your budget without explanation. Uh, so if you were going to write $6,000 for the use of a consultant, you'd need to itemize that uh, as an example. Is uh, 10 days at $500 a day plus $1,000 for travel expenses. You'll need to include this level of detail and, again, justify your need for the consultant. And you can't budget to pay a consultant more than their reasonable and regular rate of pay. Another thing to consider is your college's or your state's purchasing and procurement rules and whether you'll be required to bid out a consultant contract after receiving grant funds. Uh, NSF and reviewers prefer that you name your consultants and identify the skills, experience, and value they bring to the project in your proposal. And if you're unable to name a consultant due to purchasing rules, you'll need to include a detailed job description that states the caliber of the type of person you're seeking to do this scope of work. As an example, an external evaluator is often budgeted as a consultant to a project, and you'll want to have a named evaluator in your proposal. Uh, project evaluation is a topic unto itself, and Mentor Connect recently held a webinar on the topic of small-scale evaluation, specifically targeted to proposals in the new to ATE program track, which also included information on budgeting for evaluators. So if you'd like more information specifically on small-scale evaluation, you can access that archived recording and slides uh, from the Mentor Connect website. Moving forward to other direct costs, we have computer services. So the cost of computer services may be requested only if your existing institutional policy is to bill computer services as direct costs. This category typically refers to costs for computer-based retrieval of scientific or technical data and information necessary to support or inform your work. And justification of established computer service rates at your organization must be included. Uh, do note general purpose computer equipment, such as for word processing, should not be requested. Subawards. 
New grantees, uh, those in the new to ATE category, are not likely to have subawards in their proposals. Uh, but as some of you on the webinar may be applying for larger projects that could include subawards, I'll, I'll briefly cover this budget category. So subawards are used to fund a discrete portion of work that is carried out by another organization. The subcontracting PI is responsible for the work proposed in the subaward, and the subawardee is, the, is responsible for management and oversight of the subaward budget. However, it's the prime institution, which is your college, is ultimately responsible for all project work, including the subaward. Subawards require separate budgets, so in the main budget form, you would list the total annual subaward costs. But your budget justification must include details on the subaward, including a description of the work to be performed and a clear description of the basis of selection for the subawardee. Again, subawardees are named on the budget, and a separate budget for each subaward must be included. And in addition, in order to list a subawardee, that organization needs to be registered in Fastlane. Uh, so you would want to make sure that that is completed as well. And other, other direct costs? Any other direct costs not previously identified and that are deemed necessary to support the project must be included here, as well as detailed and itemized in the budget justification. So some example of potential, potential items budgeted here include conference registration fees or travel for advisors. And this is a picture of your total direct costs. This is the sample form from Fastlane that will calculate it. Uh, this is actually the easy part. If you'd entered all of your numbers correctly, the total direct cost for your grant proposal will be calculated for you. However, your budget is not yet complete, as you'll need to calculate your indirect costs. And I will turn it over to Elaine to cover indirect costs with you. Elaine? Thanks, Ellen. Every institution receiving a grant award from the NSF must include indirect costs in the budget. This is money from the grant that helps support the business office and other operations of the college. Including indirect costs is mandatory. Your college must include in the budget and recover indirect costs at the federally approved rate that applies to your institution at the time the grant award is made. The rate in effect at the time the grant award is made will apply throughout the life of the grant, even if the college's rate changes in the interim. The first thing you need to determine is if your institution already has a federally negotiated indirect rate. These rates change over time, so make certain that the one used in your proposal is current. During the funding process, you will be asked to provide verification of your rate. So what if you find out that your institution does not have a rate established? Well, this is an interesting situation. Your institution will not be able to apply for a federally negotiated indirect cost rate until the grant proposal you submitted has been recommended for funding. At that time, your college will likely be referred to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services to negotiate the rate. So if you find that your institution does not have a rate or that your rate has expired, what do you do in the meantime? Well, NSF has recently clarified that institutions without a federally negotiated indirect cost rate should apply the NSF de minimis rate until a rate for the college can be established. The de minimis rate is defined by NSF as 10% of modified total direct costs. Modified total direct costs are determined by subtracting ineligible costs from total direct costs. Ineligible costs are participant support, equipment, and, for the most part, subawards. NSF does allow the first $25,000 of a subaward to be included in the indirect cost calculations. One point I want to make is that it is important to pay close attention to the impact that indirect costs have on your project budget. Some institutions or community colleges systems have relatively high indirect cost rates. And this has a big impact on the amount of money you actually have to apply to the work of the grant, because indirect costs are included within the total grant request amount. Indirect costs are not in addition to the amount you are requesting for the project. Don't get tangled up about this. If you are applying for a small grant for institutions new to ATE and you submit a budget for more than $200,000, as Dr. Carter pointed out earlier, 
the proposal will most likely not be reviewed with the small grants for institutions new to ATE. Instead, the proposal will be placed for review with the larger, much more competitive general pool of ATE project proposals. Make this error and your chances of funding will go way down. It is likely that you will find yourself reworking a budget multiple times to accommodate indirect costs. The sooner you understand what the impact of indirect costs are on your overall budget, the better you can plan your scope of work. Here are a couple of things to keep in mind as you are grappling with the issue of indirect costs that must be applied to your grant budget. Institutions may have more than one federally negotiated indirect cost rate. For example, it is not uncommon to have an on-campus rate and an off-campus rate. If the off-campus rate is typically, and the off-campus rate is typically considerably lower. What is important to understand about this is that NSF leaves it up to the college to choose which of their federally negotiated indirect cost rates it will use on a proposal. For this reason, you may have access to a lower indirect cost rate. At my college, for example, the on-campus rate is over 40%, whereas the off-campus rate is 15%. For the Mentor Connect project, the college authorized the use of the 15% off-campus rate, which allowed more grant funds to be applied to grant activities and personnel. Another little-known fact is that NSF never asks how the college uses the indirect cost it collects on a grant. The portion of the grant award that the college receives as indirect cost may be used for college expenses as the institution sees fit. In some situations, we have known college presidents to allocate some or all indirect costs collected from a grant back to the project or department that is implementing the project. You may want to explore this possibility at your location. Now, let's look and see how you calculate indirect costs for your budget. For determining the indirect cost amount for your project, you will need to determine something called a base amount for the indirect cost calculation. Indirect costs are typically based on the institution's personnel costs, which may be only salaries and wages or the combination of salaries, wages, and fringe benefits. Some indirect cost rates, however, are based on overall cost of institutional operations. If based on personnel, which is the most common, then the base will be the total for budget sections A and B or A, B, and C. On the other hand, if your indirect cost rate is based on all operational costs, then the calculation is a little more complicated. To apply the indirect cost rate in this case, use total direct cost minus budget items that are not allowed as part of the base. In either case, you must explain your base amount for each year on the budget form, enter the base amount, and supply the rate to be applied. The budget form then automatically calculates indirect costs. It can be tricky to get all of this work to work out right and not exceed $200,000 for those of you seeking the small grants, which is just one more good reason not to put off budget work until the last minute. Okay, so we're going to recap. Indirect cost rates are federally um, negotiated. And uh, there are budget items that are not eligible for indirect costs. And you'll see those listed on your page. Um, your total direct cost will subtract those ineligible costs to give you that TMDC or total modified direct cost. Then you'll enter your percent, uh, which you just put as a number. Don't put the percent sign in there. And don't change it to a decimal. The system will do that for you. And then you calculate once the rate and the base are entered. Now we're getting to the bottom line. When you select the Calculate button in Section J, the system will automatically determine the total direct and indirect costs being requested. Note that Budget Category K, Small Business Fees, is not applicable to NSF ATE grants. So you get to skip that section. 
For NSF ATE proposal budgets, the amount in this section will match Section J. Your request will be the same as the sum of your direct and indirect costs. And once again, notice the calculate and save, very important. After completing all of this work, like magic, you have a neatly formatted budget in the Fastlane system. You repeat the process for each budget year of the project, and each year's budget will look like this. Once budgets for all years have been created, then the cumulative budget will be generated by Fastlane for you. The cumulative budget reflects totals for budget categories for all years and must not exceed the maximum allowed for the grant for which you are applying. Okay, um, Charlotte, do we want to look at some questions at this point? Absolutely. Thank you, Elaine. Um, we have a lot of great questions that have come in. So prior to discussion about our last segment, budget justification, let's take a few moments to address those questions. Um, one question, I want to go back to Cheryl Olson. Um, who posed a really great question early on. <clears throat> Her question is, how, how do you calculate a technician's salary if they will be uh, full-time during one year of the project but not progressing on in following grant years? And Elaine, um, if you could take that question. Okay. Um, well, it's perfectly acceptable to have someone budgeted in one year of a grant and not in subsequent years. Um, if you are uh, applying for a small grant for institutions new to ATE, it is likely that you will um, receive a standard grant award, which means that you will get the entire $200,000 or thereabouts uh, when you get your grant award, which means that if you um, you know, that gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of how much you pay these people each year because you um, will have their the whole award up front. Um, with continuing awards, you get your budget um, awarded in increments each year. And that in that case, it's much more important to have the number just right for that year. Uh, but I think what you can do in your system um, perhaps is to, to, when you go in the first year, you select, uh, you put your technicians, um, salary in there, but then in years two and three, you just don't list the person and you don't list the money. Um, I think that would probably work. Awesome. And uh, the next question, it's uh, in reference to equipment. It's taking us back just a tad. Ellen, um, are scanners for, say, a grants office uh, allowable as an expense, or e how do I handle equipment of this kind? And that question is from Beverly. And um, Elaine, do you have any feedback on this particular question? Um, Ellen may have her mic muted. Um, you have to be very careful with uh, equipment like a scanner, uh, and you should not be purchasing equipment with grant funds for your grant office, if that was the question. Um, equipment that's purchased for the project itself must be used you know, uh, explicitly for that project. It needs to have a very specific purpose. There needs to be something about that project that you're doing that would not be possible if you didn't have that piece of equipment. Um, the normal everyday office equipment is um, is the toughest to justify with your grant funds, so I'd be very uh, very careful with that. All right, much appreciated. Uh, we had some discussion in the chat box related to substitute teachers and how to handle participant support in reference to this particular group. Um, but as a follow up, there was an additional question. Uh, from Chris, Kristen Childers asking that um, if she's, you know, providing support for a substitute high school teacher, uh, what participant support category would substitute pay for participating high school teachers? 
what would that fall under? Is it stipends? Is it subsidies? Uh, I would, uh, well, subsistence is really food. Uh, I would put it under stipends, but in your in your uh, budget justification, be sure you, you know, say that that it's substitute, you know, it's a substitute pay. I've actually worked with colleges who who didn't allow stipends. That 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 anything that was called a stipend couldn't be paid at their college, um, and so they had to call what they were, uh, you know, they what they were compensating people with something other than that, but that's the category it was budgeted in. All right, thank you. And Kristen, hopefully um, we've addressed your question. Just a couple more questions before we move forward. Um, Rose had a, a really great question. Is the college's grant writer considered part of the college's indirect costs? I think NSF would probably think so, yes. And, um, and Ellen or Elaine, uh, would a subawardee be considered a subrecipient or a subcontractor? Uh, yes. That those those terms are are all mean essentially the same thing. Um, it's sort of like you know, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, and NSF just calls. Uh, calls them subawards, but they are called sub. If they're called a subcontract by your college, then the document that that you use internally to contract with that person could be called that, but it's still going to be called a subaward in your NSF budget, where the money's coming from to pay that contract. Thank you. Uh, Fred Hills has a question. What if our indirect cost rate has not been recalculated in over say? 20 years because we have not had a grant for um, a federal agency, what should we use? Will we use the de minimis rate or should we? Yes, you'll need to use the de minimis rate until your uh, rate can be uh, renegotiated. Uh, because you have had one in the past, they may let you go ahead and begin that renegotiation um, in advance of being recommended for funding. Um, I'm not 100% sure about that, uh, but you could check with the uh, organization that did your rate all those years ago to see whether or not, you know, see what their pro pro process is for upgrading it and getting it um, redone for today um, so it's current. Uh, but if you if you can't get that done by the time you want to put your proposal in or close to that time, uh, go ahead and use the de minimis rate. Awesome. And, um, one last question. This one is something that I believe a lot of uh, those who are seeking uh, status as new to ATE may grapple with, and this comes from David. Our indirect cost rate is right around 70%, although we've never requested more than 8%. If we must take 70%, how can we accurately budget for grant activities if we only have 30% of a budget to work with? Well, I think that's what you call between <laughs> being between a rock and a hard place. Um, you you are definitely one who's in a position that you need to talk to your administration about uh, whether or not you can get some of that money, uh, you know, rechanneled back into your project. Uh, you will just have to seriously limit the scope of your of your project with an integrated cost rate that high, um, and just hope that you can. Um, like I said, that the institution will provide additional support from the indirect back to the project so that you can just, you know, exceed expectations and do more than you have budgeted to do in your project, um, which will help you with your uh, grant outcomes, which will then help you with your next grant. Um, but that's a, that's a very challenging situation to be in. Absolutely. Um, well, thank you, Elaine and Ellen, for um, your feedback, both in the chat box and as well as addressing our participants directly. Uh, at this time, we have a final segment in reference to budget justification. So at this time, Elaine, please, the mic is all yours. OK, thank you. Um, as you can see, the budget form does not provide a way for you to provide details about why you're asking for the funds. 
So you'll prepare a budget justification for this purpose. The budget justification provides an opportunity to demonstrate that your budget is right for your project. It is important that reviewers conclude that you are neither asking for too little nor too much money to accomplish the work plan you have described in your proposal. The reason you are requesting funds for various purposes should be logical. You should never ask for money in the budget that doesn't tie directly to an activity, something, or someone you have described in the project description. It is of great importance that the budget and the project description be mutually supported. You are allowed up to three pages for your budget justification. It is uploaded separately within the budget section and is not counted towards any other page limits in preparing the proposal. There is no specific format required for a budget justification. I will share an example in a commonly used narrative format. First, some general pointers on budgeting. Think about the costs associated with everything you are planning. Carefully align activities with corresponding budget amounts that will make the work possible and reasonable. Actually research all anticipated costs, don't just guess. It takes time to research costs so that you can be very specific about the amounts of money that are needed and for what purpose. This is yet another reason not to delay building your budget and preparing your budget justification this simply isn't a last minute job. Once your budget justification is prepared, convert your budget justification document into a PDF document before uploading. Fastlane can do some funny things to special characters and uploading PDF files eliminates this from happening. Even so, after uploading, always check to see if the document looks right and that you have not exceeded the page limit. So, your budget needs to make sense to reviewers and program officers. If someone asks you for money, what would you want to know? How much money? If the total is made up of several costs, such as travel, how much is being requested for each component part of the total? Earlier, Ellen talked about, you know, uh, airline fees, hotel, um, you know, various costs like that. They want to know the specifics, how many days you're going to be traveling. For whom do you need money? Personnel, participants, consultants? Who are these people? And what will they do to contribute to the project? With what compensation over what period of time? What items do you plan to purchase and why? And how will items or equipment be used in a project activity to benefit students or participants? Attention to detail is important to reviewers. They want to know that you have really thought through and calculated what resources will be needed for the project to be successful. Now let's look at a copy of um, budget justification sample. I realize the print is extremely slow, small here and I don't expect you to be able to read it. Um, but you can see in this case that the budget justification paragraphs are created to describe cost. Reviewers find it very helpful if you label the paragraphs with alphabet letters corresponding to the NSF budget form. For example, A will be senior personnel and E will be travel. If you're not requesting money in a category, just list the alphabet letter and indicate not applicable. Um, I think uh, you can see the alphabet letters. I suspect you can see that in the, in the budget categories that, that fit with the NSF budget form. Um, and you can see the level of detail, um, how many years, what the total is for the year, the trips, the number of days, the rate per day, um, airline fares, uh, you know, parking, baggage, you know, all of those details that go into uh, working out costs. If you've got some participant support, uh, for instance, subsistence that Ellen Haas mentioned, um, that's where it's important to talk about how many participants you're going to be supporting. Because you want, you know, if you're going to have 20 participants, then you want to figure out how many, you know, what your meal charges will be for those particular participants, or what per diem or uh, reimbursement you would be giving them uh, for that particular item. So uh, think through all of that very carefully. Um, the organization uh, of this uh, budget justification and its clarity uh, really can convey to um, 
that to the reviewers that you put a great deal of thought into the proposal. And quite frankly, once you get funded, it reminds you of how you came up with those numbers. You know, I find the budget justification uh, a very useful tool for managing a grant once it's awarded. Now there's one more page to this, just to, to wrap it up. This is under the other direct cost. And um, the consultant services are on this page. Uh, which included the um, external evaluator and so forth. So um, I hope that'll give you a, a good idea of a, of a way that you can do your budget justification. All right, Charlotte, I think we're uh, ready to move to our final questions um, once we review some uh, budget justification mistakes. Uh, one thing is making them um, your justification either too short or too long. Remember, you're limited to three pages, and um, you want it to be really well organized and easy to follow. Uh, don't throw in things that are not explained. Uh, as I put on a previous uh, slide, uh, someone once told me it's very difficult to get anybody to fund, etc. So don't don't um, don't be really vague about things. Be very specific. Um, be sure you give the time and rate for your consultants. That's one that, that gets kicked back a lot of times during the uh, funding process. Uh, you've got to justify the time you're asking for for personnel. You know, what, what are these people going to be doing for the money that you're asking? Um, and don't include overload pay for full-time faculty unless, as Dr. Carter pointed out, you've talked with the program officer, you've gotten this approved in advance. Uh, and uh, the materials and supplies category shouldn't be used as a slush fund. Sometimes if you, you know, you just put in $500 every year of your budget for materials and supplies, it's going to look to the reviewers like a slush fund. You need to specify what it is in the materials and supplies category that you would uh, anticipate needing over the life of the project. And uh, don't put part-time faculty as consultants or participants. Um, you need to budget them if they're at your college. Um, as part of your, is uh, up under other personnel. Okay, Charlotte, I think we're back to you. All right, thank you. And um, <clears throat> we've come to some final questions, but as we do so, we want to remind all of our participants that um, in order to continue to bring you substan uh, substantive webinar content, your feedback is crucial. So um, we're not just done just yet, but um, here in a few moments we will ask that you provide some feedback on our evaluation survey, um, so please stay tuned for that. But with that, we have some wonderful questions that will help us wrap up our webinar today, and the first one comes from Christine. Christine asks, what if one of your co-PIs will serve without compensation? Where do you talk about them if you're not supposed to put it in the budget justification, and won't that make a mismatch between what's in the narrative and what's in my budget? Uh, Elaine, if you don't mind, I'd like to pitch that to you. Okay, uh, if a co-PI is serving without compensation, do not put them in the budget. Um, you can describe them in the budget narrative. You can you can name them. You can give them a scope of work in your in your. Uh, budget outline, and then when you uh, get to the forms, like I said, in May we're going to do a forms webinar, and one of the forms uh, is a, has a, an gives you an opportunity to talk about other personnel um, who are going to be helping with your project but are not going to be compensated by the project, and this will give you yet another opportunity to explain this person's contribution. Um, and essentially they will be, you can't tie it to a dollar amount. Um, but you can explain that they're going to be doing this as, as part of their job for the college. Awesome, incredible feedback. And um, I think that that's all of the formal questions that were posed today in our chat box. Um, but I do want to encourage participants that um, if you have more questions, never hesitate to reach out to us. And know that at mentor-connect.org, we do have some of the questions similar to those that you've heard here today available for review. There are a number of ways to keep in touch with us, and uh, we encourage you to do so as you journey through completing your 
grant proposal work. We're available via Facebook, Twitter, archive webinars are available via our YouTube channel and you'll receive those post webinar and we have a Mentor Connect specific email account all listed on your screen. At this time I would like to take a moment to thank our presenters Elaine and Ellen Special thanks to Dr. Carter for her time and all of these presenters' amazing advice. We must thank our friends at Maytech Networks for their hosting expertise. Thank you so much. And lastly, thanks to all of you for your participation today. We look forward to your attendance during future webinars. At this time, uh, Maytech Networks will provide an evaluation survey and it's being made available on your screen. Uh, we will see you all on the flip side, and we hope that you have an amazing day. Thank you for joining us.